We'd like to acknowledge the joint sponsorship of this lecture recital. The sponsorships are from the Department of Music at USU, the Arrington Chair of Mormon History and Culture, and the Logan Institute of Religion, and also the Book of Mormon Studies Association. We'd particularly like to welcome those attending from the Book of Mormon uh, Studies Association, all of the members attending as part of their conference this weekend. This is kind of the kickoff for their conference. We'd like to especially invite them. Uh, for those USU students attending tonight for class credit, the attendance word is mountains. <laughs> We'd like to extend a special welcome also to Dr. Christian Asplund, who was the who's the composer of the Psalm of Nephi, which is the song cycle that will uh, be announced, uh, talked about more later in the program. Uh, Chris Machado and I, his wife, both studied with Dr. Asplin in Music Theory 3 back in the day, and uh, I still remember how Dr. Asplin helped me actually learn to love some of Debussy's more esoteric kind of odd music. You know, sometimes Debussy, you're like right with him, and other times you're like, ah, but Dr. Asplin was really great at helping me come to terms with that. Uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Mason first, and then I'll do a brief introduction of Chris Machado. Dr. Mason, Dr. Patrick Mason, is a professor of religious studies at, and history at Utah State University, where he holds the Leonard J. Arrington Chair of Mormon History and Culture. He is the author or editor of several books, including, most recently, Proclaim Peace, The Restoration's Answer to an Age of Conflict, co-authored co with David Pulsifer. Professor Mason is frequently consulted by the local and national media for stories on Latter-day Saint history, culture, and theology. He lives here in Logan with his wife, Melissa, and their four children. Chris Machado, who will be singing the solo pieces tonight, is a master's student in the choral conducting program here at USU. He received a bachelor's degree of music education from Brigham Young University in 2014, and then went on to be a high school choir teacher in Nampa, Idaho. Chris is an active member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and as his wife, I can try to make him blush a little bit by publicly proclaiming that Chris's deep devotion to Jesus Christ and his church is one of the primary things that made me fall in love with him. In our almost 12 years of marriage, Chris's devotion has increasingly deepened, and I have increasingly fallen in love. And when you hear his voice, you don't get to take him home with you. He's mine. <laughs> he is a current resident of Logan and lives with his wife, that's me, and our four young children. Uh, a brief reminder to silence all noise-making devices, except pacemakers, you can leave those on. Uh, and, uh, but anything that's not an emergency noise-making device, please silence those as we will be recording tonight. And will you join me in welcoming Dr. Mason to the stage? Thanks, Sarah. Uh, uh, great to have you here. Thank you all for coming here uh, tonight. Uh, this event was Chris's idea several months ago. He said, wouldn't it be kind of fun if we did something like this? And we were like, yeah, it'd be a lot of fun. I don't know if anybody will show up, but it'll, but it'll be fun. Uh, so thank you for being here. We are thrilled uh, to, to share this evening with you. Thanks to everybody who's helped make uh, tonight possible, all, all the staff here and, and in uh, the music department and the history and religious studies department. Uh, thrilled to have the Logan Institute singers with us tonight. Um, so I, I think we're in for a, a really special uh, evening together. All right, so, so my job is to help uh, kind of set the stage a little bit in terms of this remarkable uh, text. Uh, of scripture that has been set to music in the three pieces that we'll hear later on. The Book of Mormon is the most successful book of scripture to originate in the Western Hemisphere. With over 190 million copies published since it first appeared in 1830, it is the third most widely printed and distributed book in the history of the West behind only A Tale of Two Cities and The Little Prince. By contrast, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone has sold a measly 120 million copies. <laughs> Though if you total all the Harry Potters together, it's over 500 million. Uh, 
Now, it admit, admittedly, there's a bit of a difference between selling that many books and giving them away on, doorstop, uh, on doorsteps or in the bedside drawers of a Mar Marriott hotel. Still, it's a pretty remarkable feat uh, in terms of world scripture uh, coming out of the Western Hemisphere. Now, the Book of Mormon's literary reception has not typically matched its ubiquity. Early reviews were, shall we say, not strong. In his 1832 analysis of the Book of Mormon, not subtly called delusions, rival preacher Alexander Campbell said that the Book of Mormon is, without exaggeration, the meanest book in the English language. I would as soon compare a bat to the American eagle, a mouse to a mammoth, as to contrast it with a single chapter in all the writings of the Jewish or Christian scriptures. In his 1886 book, Roughing It, Mark Twain famously wrote, the book is a curiosity to me. It's such a pretentious affair, and yet so slow, so sleepy, such an insipid mess of inspiration. It is chloroform in print. If Joseph Smith composed this book, the act was a miracle. Keeping awake while he did it was, at any rate. Of course, these opinions are countered by the millions of readers who have found divine inspiration in the book's pages. One enthusiastic early reader, Parley Pratt, had the exact opposite experience as Twain. In an oft-quoted passage from his autobiography, he recalled, I read all day. Eating was a burden. I had no desire for food. Sleep was a burden when the night came, for I preferred reading to sleep. As I read, the Spirit of the Lord was upon me, and I knew and comprehended that the book was true, as plainly and manifestly as a man comprehends and knows that he exists. Now, in general, I think it's fair to say that readers over the years have had a stronger response to the Book of Mormon's religious teachings and spiritual power than its purely literary merits. Even one of the book's chief academic defenders and advocates, Grant Hardy, stopped short of claiming it, it's, that it's on par with the Bible literarily. Rather, he claimed somewhat modestly that the Book of Mormon is a much more interesting text, rewarding sustained critical attention than has generally been acknowledged. Now, our task this evening is not to defend or critique the Book of Mormon's truth claims. And tonight, instead, tonight, we're going to zero in on just one Book of Mormon passage, a group of 20 verses in the modern LDS edition. This section of text by the Book of Mormon's first narrator, Nephi, arguably rivals the lyricism, pathos, beauty, and spiritual depth of the Bible's beloved Psalms. It's therefore come to be known as the Psalm of Nephi. Tonight, you're going to hear three musical settings of the Psalm of Nephi, performed by the Logan Institute Singers and by tenor Chris Machado. Chris is far more qualified to introduce the music, so I'll leave that to him. Instead, I just want to spend a few minutes talking about the text itself and the way that it's been read and interpreted over the years. I'll provide what we call a reception history, which is simply how people have read and understood a text over time and then I'll offer my own humble interpretation. The Psalm of Nephi appears near the beginning of the second book of Nephi, which is the second book in the Book of Mormon. In the previous book, 1 Nephi, we've been introduced to Nephi and his family. His father Lehi is a Hebrew prophet preaching around 600 years before the Common Era. God commands Lehi to lead his family out of Jerusalem, which is soon to be destroyed by the Babylonians. They wander through the wilderness for a few years before arriving on the seashore. There God commands Nephi, still a young man, to build a boat for the family to sail to a promised land across the sea. Throughout this first book, Nephi, the eponymous narrator, is obedient and righteous, while his oldest two brothers, Laman and Lemuel, are mercurial, doubtful, and on multiple occasions violent towards their younger brother, whom they believe is trying to usurp their rightful authority. Their escalating conflicts notwithstanding, the whole family gets on the boat and sails to the promised land. The new world, alas, does not lead to a relational reset between the brothers. As Nephi's second book begins, the family is lurching towards its ultimate conflict and eventual breakup. 
When Lehi and his wife Sariah die, there's little that still binds the brothers to one another. The fissures that have been evident since the beginning of Nephi's record now grow into a chasm. Just as he's about to narrate this final rupture in which the family angrily divides into two, with Laman leading one clan who will be called the Lamanites and Nephi leading the other who will become Nephites, the narrator Nephi interrupts the story with a remarkable and rare moment of introspective self-reflection. Now, scholars have identified Nephi's psalm as following the classic form of an individual lament, which is, which is one of the four major types of psalm in the Bible. A psalm of individual lament contains five parts. First, an invocation or an initial call to God. Second, a complaint where the supplicant describes his woes to the Lord. Third, a declaration of trust in the Lord and his abilities to relieve and reward the sufferer. Fourth, a petition in which the supplicant seeks the Lord's help in alleviating the sorrows or sufferings described in the complaint. And finally, a vow to sing a song of praise or thanksgiving to the Lord. But you don't need to know anything about Hebrew poetry to be moved by the lyricism and emotional heartbeat of Nephi's psalm. Every reader will resonate with different passages, and you've got them in your program, but here are just a few of my favorites. Behold, my soul delighteth in the things of the Lord, and my heart pondereth continually upon the things which I have seen and heard. My God hath been my support. He's filled me with his love, even unto the consuming of my flesh. Why should my heart weep and my soul linger in the valley of sorrow? O Lord, wilt thou encircle me around in the robe of thy righteousness? Awake, my soul, no longer droop in sin. Rejoice, O my heart, and give place no more for the enemy of my soul. Indeed, one of the recurring themes in the psalm is the notion of an enemy or enemies. I'm going to come back to that at the end of my remarks. But for a few moments, I want to focus on the reception of the text by its most dedicated readers, Latter-day Saints. The Psalm of Nephi is often mentioned by contemporary Latter-day Saints as one of their favorite, most edifying passages in the Book of Mormon. This was not the case for the book's earliest readers. Indeed, it seems that 19th century Latter-day Saints hardly noticed the passage at all. In the 1830 edition, the entire passage, the entire psalm is embedded in one very long paragraph. Students do not write like this, okay? The first index of the Book of Mormon, published in 1835, didn't even list the passage as worthy of note. The same was true for subsequent indices published in 1841 and 1842. Historian Grant Underwood has recorded every Book of Mormon passage that was mentioned or quoted more than once in the early church's periodicals, pamphlets, and tracts, and nothing from this extended passage makes the list. In 1883, church leader George Q. Cannon published a book called The Life of Nephi, the Son of Lehi, in which he provides a detailed biography and commentary focusing exclusively on the life of Nephi. You'd think the psalm would be in there. It's not. The same held true when Cannon published his Book of Mormon stories for children a few years later. Another major late, late 19th century Book of Mormon commentary, George Reynolds' The Story of the Book of Mormon, similarly omits any mention of the passage. In all of the church's general conferences addresses in the 19th century, there's only one clear reference to these 20 verses. In short, the text that we now call the Psalm of Nephi that so many people love was not only unimportant to early Latter-day Saints, they hardly even noticed that it was there. Now, things began to change in the middle of the 20th century, thanks to the Latter-day Saint scripture scholar Sidney Sperry. Sperry was the first devout Latter-day Saint scholar to obtain a PhD in biblical studies, and he applied that to his study of the Book of Mormon. In 1947, he published a book called Our Book of Mormon. Now, Sperry loved and believed in the Book of Mormon, but he, wasn't not, he was not a great salesman for the Book of Mormon as literature. Regarding the book as a whole, Sperry argued that it was written by simple, unsophisticated Nephite men who were not outstanding writers or orators. 
He asserted that the book has little sustained literary beauty or elegance, and that its real power comes from the profound spiritual fervor with which it teaches religious principles. Not exactly a ringing endorsement of adding the Book of Mormon as literature to the USU curriculum. But in spite of Sperry's tepid view of the Book of Mormon's overall literary value, he did grant that there were some notable exceptions, a few key passages that, in his opinion, contained considerable literary merit. And he pointed specifically to the second half of 2 Nephi chapter 4, which he proposed should be called the Psalm of Nephi. Sperry claimed that this was the only psalm that appears in the entire Book of Mormon and compared its cadence and rhythm and deep religious feeling to the biblical psalms. As far as we can tell, Sperry is not, the only one who, is not only the one who coined the term the Psalm of Nephi, but he was the first to recognize that this text provides a window into the narrator prophet Nephi's inner emotions, declaring that it lays bare to us the very depths of Nephi's soul. Sperry's book was a turning point. It marked the first step of the Psalm of Nephi's transformation from a barely noticed passage into a celebrated scriptural masterpiece, a beautifully composed piece of literature giving valuable insight into the interior life of one of the Book of Mormon's main characters. Perhaps not coincidentally, references to this passage in general conference talks immediately began to increase. Other scholarly studies of the text also started appearing. Two of the Book of Mormon's major contemporary interpreters, Grant Hardy and Chris Thomas, who's here tonight, have each noted the psalm's significance as a literary device used by Nephi in presenting his personal and family narrative. In their Book of Mormon commentary, Fatima Saleh and Margaret Olson Hemming suggest that we should read the psalm's movingly emotional language in the voice of anyone who is fleeing danger, abuse, or violence. This is the prayer of those seeking safe passage. Now, it's not just scholars and church leaders who have taken note. The text has now taken hold in the religious imagination of the Latter-day Saints. Maybe my favorite visual representation of this is an incredible piece created in 2002 by artist Ahmed Jamal Qureshi. This is called Mazmur Nafi, the Arabic Psalm of Nephi. Qureshi's father was a Muslim from Pakistan and his mother was a Mormon from Norway. I'm sure you all have friends like that. (laughs) In this digital print, and the resolution isn't great, I apologize for that, but he's written out the entire Psalm of Nephi in Arabic calligraphy. The name Allah, or God, is written in the center with the names of the four men who brought us the Book of Mormon, or the Book of Nephi, Lehi, Nephi, Moroni, and Joseph Smith, are written in the circles around the edges. This follows a pattern that's common in Ottoman mosques where Allah's name would be at the center and the names of the four rightly guided caliphs or some of uh, Muhammad's companions would be written in these round circles at each corner. I think it's just a stunning piece. In addition to artistic representations, beginning in the late 1970s, a number of Latter-day Saint authors began pointing to Nephi's psalm as a model for how to deal with feelings of inadequacy discouragement, and depression. The psalm has become a regular resource for those wrestling with or providing counsel on the all-too-present trap in Latter-day Saint culture of perfectionism, pointing to the uber-righteous Nephi to the fact that he struggled with feelings of sin and weakness, so it's normal to do so. So 19th century Book of Mormon readers placed greater emphasis on the chapters around 2 Nephi chapter 4, and all but ignored Nephi's psalm. But today, the reverse is largely true. Why would this be the case? I think it's in part a result of the psychological turn in 20th century Euro-American culture, and especially the therapeutic culture that's taken hold from the 1950s onward. In other words, we are more attuned and interested than 19th century readers were about an author's interior life. What makes them tick? How do they identify and wrestle with the inner demons that we know are the common lot of humanity? How do their thoughts, feelings, and experiences relate to our own? The ever stalwart Nephi of first Nephi can be a little off-putting to modern readers who seem as just a little too perfect, a little too good. Someone whose unfailing goodness makes him difficult to relate to. 
but a Nephi who admits that his soul grieveth because of mine iniquities, who's encompassed about by the temptations and the sins which do so easily beset me, whose heart weeps and whose soul lingers in the valley of sorrow, who is angry because of mine enemy, this is a Nephi who needs a therapist. This is a Nephi we can relate to. So in considering how Nephi's psalm speaks to today, I want to offer my own reading of the text, which I developed with my friend and co-author David Pulsifer. Previously, I mentioned how Nephi, writing his account decades later, inserted this psalm immediately before he narrates the final breakup of the family. In anguish of soul, he cries out, O wretched man that I am! Yea, my heart sorroweth because of my flesh. My soul grieveth because of mine iniquities. I am encompassed about because of the temptations and the sins which do so easily beset me. Now, this all seems a little abstract, even precious. After all, to this point, Nephi has been constantly faithful in contrast to his brother's faithlessness. But in the middle of Nephi's psalm, he shifts to particulars and reveals the fundamental nature of his internal struggle. Why am I angry because of mine enemy? At this point in the story, Nephi's brothers are the only enemies he has. This is an expression of regret and longing for family harmony that might have been. Here Nephi does not express regret for his brother's choices. He's already amply detailed their murmuring and their violence. Rather, in the psalm, we hear him expressing remorse for his own role in the strife. Maturity has brought greater self-awareness. And the seasoned prophet can now acknowledge that his own anger has also contributed to the family rift. On the very cusp of the family's breakup, which in retrospect he knows will be decisive, Nephi abruptly stops his narration and gives us this soul-anguished psalm. It's as if Nephi at last recognizes his own culpability in the tortured family dynamic and cries out in grief at missed opportunities for reconciliation. O wretched man that I am. But by now, it's too late to stop. Now that the family patriarch and matriarch are dead and the leadership of the family is truly at stake, the older brothers can't get past their years of well-nurtured grievance. They dig in. They're unpersuadable. By the time Nephi seems to fully recognize and repent of his anger, his older brothers are too far down the path of nursing theirs. Festering, unreconciled grievance becomes the wedge that splits the family apart. Deep-seated hostility becomes the defining feature in the ensuing decades and centuries of conflict between erstwhile kin who now call themselves Nephites and Lamanites. The psalm ends with Nephi putting his trust in God for his redemption, but by now it's only a personal redemption. Reconciliation for the divided Nephites and Lamanites won't occur for centuries, and even then it'll only be temporary. And perhaps... It's through this lens that we can see why the Psalm of Nephi has become a, become a text perfectly suited for our age. It speaks deeply to individual feelings of inadequacy, anxiety, anxiety about one standing before God, the depths of depression that are so often part and parcel of the human experience, but also to the liberation, strength, and resilience that many believers find in their personal relationship with a God who makes their path straight and is the rock of their salvation. Yet while divine mercy provides Nephi and countless readers since a modicum of individual comfort, his psalm is also a cautionary tale for our times. We live not only in an age of anxiety, but also in an age of grievance. A time when many people feel that they are surrounded by enemies, who are angry at those enemies, who want God or some other force to confound those enemies, to cause them to quake, to have their ways hedged up, and ultimately to remove them as stumbling blocks. Despite expressing his trust in the Lord's power to do those very things, Nephi's wish is not granted. He knows, writing decades later, that the Lamanites are still there, 
If anything, the conflict has gotten worse, not better. There has been no reconciliation. Neither has there been the destruction of his enemies. At the end of his life, Nephi writes powerfully about the universality of God's love. And he wants to model this inclusive love. He says, I have charity for my people. I have charity for the Jew. I have charity for the Gentiles. But notice who's missing from the list. Nephi is curiously silent on the question of whether his love extends so far as to include his estranged cousins, the Lamanites. Perhaps the wounds of the family rupture are still too raw. Perhaps the anguish of prophetically knowing that his descendants would eventually be destroyed by the Lamanites was too exquisite. But for whatever the reason, Nephi never utters the words, I also have charity for the Lamanite. That level of enemy love would remain a project left to later teachers and later generations. So now we turn to these three stunning musical settings of Nephi's psalm. While appreciating the beauty and the music, the beauty of the music and the lyrics, perhaps you can also reflect on what this text means for us today, for you today, in our age of anxiety and our age of grievance. The psalm occurs at the point of the Book of Mormon narrative when small-scale interpersonal conflicts set the stage for what will later develop into massive wars and eventually a civilizational holocaust. The book asks the question, is this the world we want to live in? Or is there an off-ramp from the superhighway of unreconciled grievance? The book prompts us to ask ourselves, alongside Nephi, why am I angry because of mine enemy? The difference between him and us, I would suggest, is not the basic experience or raw emotion. We all have enemies who make us angry. The difference is that unlike Nephi, frozen in time on the written page, you and I have the power to do something about it. And with that, please join me in welcoming Chris Machado to the stage. Thanks, Dr. Mason, for that. Um, And thank you for coming. Appreciate you being here tonight. I won't talk very long, I just want to introduce the, uh, the music we'll be hearing. That's nice. I like that. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, we're going to hear three pieces of music tonight. The first two are settings of poetic metrical paraphrases of the Psalm of Nephi, which were authored by John S. Tanner, uh, who is a poet, educator, and administrator. Um, From 2015 to 2020, he was the president of Brigham Young University, Hawaii. Um, And these uh, metric paraphrases he wrote in 1999. Um, There's a long tradition of metric psalters, particularly stemming from the the, uh, Protestant Reformation as communal singing of hymns rather than just singing by the clergy or by professional musicians uh, developed in the Protestant liturgy. Um, and uh, John wrote that he felt like the Psalm of Nephi was just calling for the same treatment. So he wrote two different metrical paraphrases. Uh, the first, he noticed that the line, Awake my soul, no longer droop in sin, fits in a perfect iambic pentameter. And so he kind of took that as the basis and, and the, the whole thing, the whole paraphrase is in, in that iambic pentameter. And uh, he also noticed that it fit the tune Finlandia perfectly. This is a tune written by Jean Sibelius in 1899, the Finnish composer, and it's at the end of, uh, of uh, I'm embarrassed, I can't remember the name of the piece. Someone will tell me later, but, but uh, it, it's become a sort of common in at least Latter-day Saint hymnody, and we know it as the hymn, Be Still My Soul. Um, this arrangement is by Ron Staley, who is the former director of choral studies at, at BYU. Um, and you're going to hear in just a moment the uh, Logan Institute singers perform that. Uh, after that, I'm going to perform uh, the other paraphrase written by John Tanner. Um, 
which is uh, Sometimes My Soul, uh, which is set to the tune that you might be familiar with, the American folk song, Poor Wayfaring Stranger. And this is a, an arrangement that was done by K. Newell Daly, who is a prominent Latter-day Saint composer and hymn writer, um, and uh, uh, wrote hymns and songs that Latter-day Saints might be familiar with, like, Lord, I would follow thee, faith in every footstep, or I feel my Savior's love. Um, and uh, I asked Lawrence Loriano, my fabulous accompanist, who you'll meet in a minute, I don't know if I asked him, he suggested it, but, but he's going to do a bit of an improvisation on the second verse. So I, I don't think uh, Newell Daly's here tonight, so if he is, I'm sorry. But you won't be sorry because Lawrence is a fabulous pianist. And it's, it's really good. Then the third one is the piece of music that got this whole project started for me. Uh, it's uh, the Psalm of Nephi, a song cycle by Christian Asplund, uh, who is here tonight. Um, and... Uh, as he was writing it, he was sharing individual songs on Facebook, and I would, a couple of times, Sarah and I printed them off and sang through them, and I, I just loved it. I thought it was fabulous. So uh, <clears throat> with, with the whole completed song cycle, I bought the score, and I uh, went through it, and I thought, this needs to be performed. It's fabulous. Um, uh, Christian has set the, the text in its almost in its entirety with a couple of small changes, but it's not a paraphrase. Um, you can read more about Dr. Asplund in your program. Um, he is a professor of, of uh, theory and composition at BYU, which is what Sarah talked about where, where we were as undergraduates. Um, he has set a lot of Book of Mormon texts um, he's written hundreds of hymns in, in uh, five volumes in a project called the Brick Church Hymnals. And volume five is all Book of Mormon texts. There are dozens of compositions to Book of Mormon texts. In fact, I'm not sure that I know of another uh, composer that's writing and setting so many Book of Mormon texts. Um, I'll just say, you're going to hear it, so I won't talk about it for too long, but I'll just say that you'll notice that the compositional style is flexible and it's totally devoted to the text in each song. You're gonna hear, I think, moods and feelings like gentle wonder, free rhythms, soaring, ecstatic, meditative, reflective, peaceful, even nervous. Each song is unique in its color and its mood, with the voice and the piano taking turns being prominent in the storytelling. And, uh, and I think, largest of all, uh, it's so very human, this setting is. So personal. It really gets inside of, uh, inside of Nephi, inside of his mind, inside of his heart. And as I sing it, I feel like I can connect uh, so strongly with this message. And uh, this is ideal to enriching our understanding and application of this text. So. So that's what I have to say about the three songs. First, we're going to have the, uh, the Logan Institute singers from the Logan Institute of Religion come up and perform the uh, first one, since it's a choral work. They're directed by Alan Matthews. And then afterwards, Sometimes My Soul and Psalm of Nephi. So enjoy.
because of my flesh. Yea, why should I give way to temptations that the evil one have place in my heart to destroy my peace and afflict my soul? Why am I angry?
Thank you. 